in the radio operators when they're uh, using their equipment is that uh, terrible stuff called noise. And what I'm going to show you tonight is that terrible stuff called noise uh, has an origin and uh, how you can use it to uh, advantage. I'm going to put the microphone down next to the uh, device here because there's some audio uh, that you need to hear at certain times. And then I'm trying uh, to use this to change the slides. And uh, I, I think I'm going to run out of hands. So <laughs> but let's get started. Say it again. You put your mic by the projector. Right. That's fine. That's. Radio Joe is a play on uh, uh, call signs for. Uh, commercial radio stations, J-O-V-E. So what is, uh, what is it about all this noise that uh, we're going to talk about tonight? Well, first we're going to start with the galactic background radiation. Um, believe it or not, when you turn on your radios and you hear that hiss, you're listening to the galaxy. Now, any good normal radio that we use that noise is actually from up there. We're going to see how we're going to use that uh, to an advantage. But where did this all start? So we need to go back and begin where this all began. That's about 13 billion to 15 billion years ago, depending upon who you ask and who's doing the calculation. Big Bang we're going to talk about is uh, a theoretical construct that essentially happened a long time ago. And there wasn't a galaxy far, far away because none exists. But what you see before you is a brief history of the universe. And I have a lightsaber now. Big Bang, and as we increase in the y direction, present day. And all this stuff here is what happened in the interval of, uh, in that time period. And ultimately, we ended up with uh, the galaxy in which we live. And that's that hiss that you hear where it's coming from on your radios. So here's a uh, depiction of the galaxy in which we live, the Milky Way. And we're not in the center, luckily, because we wouldn't be here talking about it. We're off to the side about 8,000 or so light years away from the center of our galaxy, and uh, we believe we live in a galaxy that looks like this, a spiral galaxy, and when we're listening to that galactic noise that we hear, we're looking essentially into the plane of that, okay, and that's what your radio is picking up. Oops. Now, this is a uh, photograph on, on top of which we have some figures that have been uh, superimposed. And uh, if you're wondering where the center of our galaxy is, it's in the constellation Sagittarius, which never gets too high above our horizon. So you're typically, depending on the antenna you're using, unless you're actually aiming at it, you're not going to hear the center of the galaxy, but you're going to hear the Milky Way. And the center of the galaxy is depicted by that arrow, and you notice that it's very dark there, and the reason it's dark is a lot of dust in the way. Big window was discovered by an astronomer looking, trying to see if he could see into the dust or a place where there would be less dust. And uh, this is the location uh, that's used right at the end of the teapot of Sagittarius. The beginning of radio astronomy. Carl Jansky was uh, the first person to actually pick up uh, emissions from up there. 
He wasn't an amateur radio operator, but he was. I don't understand. No problem. Oops. He built an antenna, and this was his merry-go-round antenna. And it's essentially a bunch of dipoles. And here's the trace. And as you move the antenna around in a 20-minute period, you get this increase. This was the first captured radio emission from our galaxy. Here's the recording. Now, what's interesting is the size of the radio compared to what you can do with yours. And he used a strip chop recorder, and you had miles of paper, and you try to analyze it. But this was his, uh, his recording, and look at the frequency. Okay. The radio is going to handle that. Uh, and this is 1932. And you get this periodic uh, shift throughout the uh, observing set. Now we come to the first radio astronomer who was a him. Grover okay. Reber, W9GFZ. And uh, now I remember hearing a couple of talks there how you disguise antennas in your backyard and the HOAs and such. Well, apparently he didn't have this problem. And this is why I'm home. But he actually, on purpose, went ahead and listened to the entire sky to see if he can plot the, uh, the activity that was going on. And if you look, here's a plot he made in 1944, wavelength of 1.2 meters. Ooh, 1.2 meters. Two meters. We use that. And it's noisy. Cassiopeia and Cygnus, Sagittarius, the center of the galaxy. These two constellations right now almost at the zenith. The zenith is directly over your head. And when you have a meridian passage, that means if you take a line north and south, that's the meridian. And if it passes over the meridian, you have a way of uh, identifying where it's located. And these will pass over our head. But uh, you can't use FM for this. Right? You need to use AM. So if you have an AM two meter, you probably the hiss you're hearing is probably coming from one of the now this is what the galactic background noise looks like. And I'm spending time on the galactic background noise because that is the floor upon which all the other signals are going to be built. So you see there's some periodicity to what's going on here. And this is the galaxy, the Milky Way, passing overhead. So at this point, the signal is very strong. I said signal, you say noise. Noise is a signal, and here it is. Now, look at this one. This is a very good one. Can anyone tell me? We'll say left, center, uh, right. Can anyone tell me with, with, uh, which, one, which side is daytime? We have left, center, and right. We didn't hear the question. Okay, the question is left, center, right. Which section of that trace is uh, representing daytime? The middle one. The middle one. And why would that be? The sun. It's very noisy. Right? Is there any clips of the sun? Well, no, it's just noisy. That's when do you, uh, the GX in the normal way, when do you, you look for the, the atmosphere, the uh, ionosphere to, uh, to settle down so at night it's settling, right? But during the day, when the sun is in your vicinity over your head, you have lots of ionization, the D layer. Remember that from your test? The, the D layer. And you get a lot of ionization, so you get radio uh, waves being absorbed. That was his antenna that was in his backyard. <laughs> he built this, okay? And that's what he used. Now, I don't think he had to worry about the HOAs or any of that. But that was his antenna. And he made a sky survey at 160 megahertz, which is a 90 meter diameter dish. So he was the first radio astronomer who happened to be an amateur radio operator. Then we have uh, Daniel Krauss, who, uh, W-A-J-K, who uh, was uh, also very famous uh, amateur radio operator and a very famous radio astronomer. Many patents, did a lot of work, 
His is a bigger radio telescope at Ohio State, which was built by a, um, graduate students, which is, in other words, free help. And they you have this thing called the dimensions of a football field. And what he did, now this, these antennas we're going to look at uh, are steerable in a very interesting way. You don't have to physically move them. Now that, that doesn't physically move. But there are ways to change the uh, phase and actually have the thing look a little lower, a little higher, left or right. But that is a big ear. So let's take a look at radio telescope antennas. Of course, we have uh, this one in our SIBO. An interesting story here. A number of years ago, um, NASA and uh, NSF were having these white paper meetings that have to generate white paper reports. And they wanted to close this. And of course, I said, what are you going to replace it with? Oh, we don't have anything yet. So you're going to close something that works to replace it with something that you don't have yet. That makes a lot of sense. It's still running. Then a more modern version is the Jansky Very Large Array, which is next door in New Mexico. And what's interesting about this is, uh, and with the advent of technology, is you have the ability now, instead of having one gigantic dish in one location, using the very interesting techniques in interferometry, you can link uh, individual dishes that are extended by great distances. And uh, ultimately, you actually, when we do this, you can create a radio telescope the diameter of the Earth. And with other techniques that they're using, you can create a radio telescope the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Now, the larger the, wow. the larger the, now, of course, it's not physically there. Oh, right? no. But the larger you make this, the greater the resolution, so you can see finer detail. When they make all these pretty pictures, you see, and they say, let's take with a radio telescope. So, well, that's optical. How do you take a photograph of a radio telescope? That's for another time. Okay. Itchy on the trigger thing. This is a typical, in Radio Joe, you see that come up, because you see what I mean. Uh, the dipole is a phase dipole that's used, and you can't see much here, but you see a lot of, whoops, PVC pipe. Did I just zap somebody with this when I see it? I'm not going to. Right here, the, uh, there's one dipole there, one dipole there, and the rest of this stuff is just PVC and, and uh, pipes. A very in inexpensive uh, dipole. And I'll show you the one that I used uh, lately. It's a north dipole. It's a north dipole. It's a south My wife is very nice. So I, um, that was my first, uh, I experimented with this. I was interested in, in going the whole gamut. And the one that I'm using now, and this is, this is schematic well, sort of, of what that dipole looks like, quarter wave dipole. And there are two of them, and they're 28 feet or so. And uh, these dipoles are built with F connectors and the cheap coax stuff. And, cheap, and the whole point is, again, you see the end why that is done. But it worked fine. It's a receiver. You're not transmitting anything. You're not going to put a whole bunch of energy into the thing. But you make two of these, and you can phase them. And when you phase them, such as uh, you see here, you have an addition of a phasing piece of cable, which allows you to aim the antenna. Right? So now, by now, how does that work? Well, you probably remember something about the, uh, the velocity of the radio wave and the cable and uh, how that affects uh, how quickly the signal gets through it. Well, you can take advantage of that by causing a delay. So one antenna is going to be receiving this, the signal before the other one. Right? And uh, by playing around with that, by you can raise the antenna and that will uh, cause the, uh, the beam to look at the horizon. If you leave it in this configuration, the beam pattern is essentially overhead. And if you want to go a little bit north or south, uh, you can also do that by phasing. So you can play around with this. This uh, F power combiner is the one you buy for your TV set when you used to have it. That's all it is. It's right there. And uh, the coax is oh, 50 ohm. You need 50 ohm. No, you don't. You need whatever works. So, uh, <laughs> so it's cheap. So. 
I've learned a lot of, well, not so much, but quite a bit about antennas. This is a, the antenna that I'm using right now. It's a full wave um, dipole, but it's phased. And what that means is instead of a uh, full wave, you see the panel look like that, so half of it is not in phase with the other half. And ultimately, you, you know, you're going to have some signal work. But you put a little sub in here, a coil of sub, and it makes everything work nice. So that's what the programs say anyway. So this is the way it's supposed to work. This is what I'm using now. And I strain it from the outflow about 40 feet this way. It doesn't mind the trees. And again, very inexpensive. And it works. This one's the one I'm using now. The day you're going to see, I can even present it's based on that. And this is what the beam pattern should look like. And what's advantageous here is you can. Um, You've got a node right overhead, a little Jupiter comes overhead, you can see it, or when it's rising or setting, these antennas are strung east-west. Jupiter is a radio source. Now we're going to get down to DX. Two guys, Franklin and Berg, again poking around and listening. In this guy, this was uh, in the 1950s, they did their, their work. So here you have uh, a discovery that was made. Now, what they were listening for was the Pratt Nebula. Pratt Nebula has a uh, pulsar in it, very, very fast pulsar. You can't see it pulsing with the naked eye. A colleague of mine uh, from uh, eight years ago used a special type of photometer where he actually was able to capture the optical uh, image from the pulsar and uh, using some uh, interesting techniques actually slowed it down. You could see the thing pulse 30 times a second. It's pretty cool. But they were out there listening for the Crab Nebula. In 1955, they made an announcement at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting in Princeton, New Jersey. And this is what they were looking for. They kept seeing this on occasion. They didn't know what it was. A couple of people in a very sort of hilarious way making fun of that. That noise said, oh, it might be Jupiter. Well, that struck a chord, and they looked at where Jupiter was every time this was happening. And sure enough, they studied this over time, and when Jupiter was present, not all the time. Now, you can't go in and tune in Jupiter and hear it all the time, right? Other things are going on. But this is what they saw and they made the discovery. Now, what's going on that Jupiter can act like a radio transmitter? The general term is uh, cyclotronic radiation. Sometimes uh, and you use the term as well as a synchrotron or synchrotronic radiation. The difference is, uh, is subtle, and it has to do with the radius of the electron as it's flowing through a magnetic field of uh, an environment such as this. This would be a cyclotron. Now, what's happening here is uh, an acceleration of a charged particle. Acceleration of anything produces something. For example, an acceleration in, uh, in the classical physics is uh, in the following mode. If I ran really fast into that wall, there would be an acceleration. All that means is something has happened to me before and after the collision with the wall. I slowed down or I changed direction. And then the result of that with a, a body could be broken bones and so on. With an electron, or charged particle in a magnetic field spiraling down in this environment, energy is going to be released in the form of a photon, which uh, in this case would be a photon of uh, radio energy. Photons are limited to light. Radio is electromagnetic, really long wavelength radiation. So here we have Jupiter rotating merrily about 10 hours it takes, 9 point something. And you saw the red spot go by, and it's 
happily going along, but Jupiter also happens to have an extremely large magnetic field, about 14 times the magnetic field of the Earth. So if we look at the, magnet the magnetosphere of Jupiter, this is what we see. The blue lines represent the, uh, the classical representation of a magnetic field that you're familiar with from elementary school. These are several of the moons in the uh, orbit, the Galilean satellites. But this one in particular is interesting. This is the, the moon Io. And if you look, there's this ghostly donut shape or a torus. Not a torus, a torus. And here you have some connection between one of the magnetic lines, of course, and the the moon Io. So what's going on there? Well, remember, you need to change something. You need, you need charged particles to change or accelerate. You need a magnetic field through which it can spiral. So now you've got the magnetic field. Now you need the charged particles. Where they come from? That's where Io comes from. If we look at the magnetosphere of uh, Jupiter, we find a nice closed circuit an electrically closed circuit here, uh, huge amounts of current, but they start at one end of the magnetic pole of Jupiter and ultimately end up at the other end. And if it, indeed, if this is happening, just as the, it happens on Earth, what do you see at the poles, the magnetic poles, when you get a, a, an increase in activity? You see the aurora. Jupiter has an aurora. And... Uh, this was in ultraviolet light, very young jet. So here is Jupiter's moon Io, which is about the size of our moon. Now what's unusual about Io is that gravitationally it's really uh, very close to Jupiter. But it's, it's almost within a uh, special limit that if had it been any closer, it would have been pulled apart. But it's not close enough to be pulled apart, but just enough to be sort of stretched a little bit. And in that stretching, you create a great deal of friction, you can imagine. So what happens is you have a great deal of volcanic activity. Io was the first object outside of the Earth that was discovered to have volcanoes. And this was done with the, uh, the uh, Voyager spacecraft when a technician was looking at the monitor of the images that were first coming down, and she noticed on one of the monitors uh, display the, uh, the limb of Io with a very interesting mushroom shape sticking out of it. And she said, well, it looks like a volcano. And of course, the first reaction, no, nah, you're not a volcano. Are you have a volcano? Only the Earth has volcanoes. Because you think scientists know everything, right? And uh, she was right. When they enhanced the image, they couldn't get away from it, the fact that they were looking at an erupting volcano. You know, it looks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. Probably a duck. So that image looks something like this. Now, of course, this volcano, you spew all this uh, stuff in it, charged particles, a lot of sulfur, and so on. And where does that end up? Well, it ends up in orbit around the moon in that torus. Now, Jupiter's got a huge gravity field as well. So everything's going to get captured. And here's the proof from the Galileo uh, spacecraft that's in that environment still. And uh, here's one high-resolution image. Here's another one a few months later. Notice this. This lava flowing on Io. That the surface of Io is constantly repaid. I mean, it's, it's like new stuff is coming out of this uh, surface. That's a result of all this activity. Okay, now, the Jovian decameter sources. Decameter, tens of meters. That's what we're talking about. A couple of terms that are um, important here. CML, the line of take, uh, longitude, longitude of Jupiter facing the Earth. In other words, it's nothing more than uh, the long lines on the Earth's uh, uh, map, right? The longitude lines. So if we look at Jupiter and we divide Jupiter up in a similar way, uh, you can have these lines of longitude looking at the Earth. So this is the first thing we're interested in. Well, over time, thousands and thousands of hours of monitoring Jupiter, things started to come out. 
And uh, one of the things that came out is when you looked at the central meridian, the devil was looking at us, there were three distinct areas where the probability of listening to some emission from Jupiter became very apparent. And here we have uh, uh, from 0 to 360 degrees. So at about 150, you get uh, a bump, and we call that the B bump. The A bump at 250 uh, or so, 65, is very strong. And then the C bump, this axis has the probability that an emission may occur. And of course, the Earth is down there facing it. So you think of a lighthouse being sweeping past, and if you're intercepting it, that's what will happen. So now, here we have a complication because of Io. So when Io is in orbit around uh, Jupiter, and here's the Earth, and here are the three A, B, and C regions, when Io happens to be in one of these regions, the probability of an emission goes way up. We still don't un understand why this happens, right? This is still unknown. And you could make contributions. Uh, in your observations that can actually add to this knowledge. So if we take and fill a probability map or a 3D contour map, this, uh, these mountains represent IO, uh, with IO involved, IO A, B, and C, and then a sort of a little mountain ridge here. If you're flying the map, you get this nice little thing up here, which then allows you to make predictions. And this becomes very important. Now, by the way, the programs that do this are all free. So you could actually download these programs. And, uh... of Jupiter's central uh, meridian longitude and Io's position, and this is uh, five rotations of Jupiter. That can be predicted, and it's plotted, and uh, there's another program that allows you to do that. And that's what the output of that program looks like. It plots the position of Jupiter, and we use universal time for all these measures, so we can coordinate among others and everyone in the right day. And uh, here you have where the, uh, the number of the region gets uh, closer to red, the probability of an emission of uh, an activity, a storm as it's called, will increase. And here you have a plot of the central meridian CML versus uh, Io's orbital phase. So when these two things are working together, you can plot this and make a prediction. Now, you don't always get a, an sometimes you get an a, a non-IOA activity, sometimes you now you'll see this probably when you miss it again. So you didn't get anything, although you did before. So it's not predictable, although the predictability goes up if uh, things are just right. So here's what these sound like. There are two types. There's the outburst and the S-burst. The outburst, now of course, we're astronomers and psychologists, so we don't have big vocabulary. The outburst is L for long, and the S is S for short. The long bursts sound like waves on a beach, or maybe the ruffling of a plastic bag hanging on your antenna. And the S-bursts are like popcorn, or someone described it as pebbles thrown on a, uh, a roof made of tin. But I'll let you hear. And the 
It's on a pill. What frequency is this? 20.1 megahertz. Okay, now let's go to, uh, whoops. Oh, eh, how do I do this? Oh, yeah, I can do this. Let's go and hear the uh, S burst. And again, it sort of starts off, then builds, and fades away. Earth. That's what I've been doing at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> this thing's a popcorn. <laughs> I have the antenna to prove it. Is that Jupiter or is that the popcorn that left in the microwave? Yeah. <laughs> I love it though. Okay, this is data I actually collected. This was on the 3rd of October. This was a Jupiter in the C region, uh, Michelle, I saw, and it's an L burst, a long burst, and uh, this is the graph of that at the same time uh, that I heard. I was actually listening and watching this happen, and I just captured uh, the graph and so on. So here's what, the, here's what this is. You have to have patience when you do it. Yes? What's the horizontal axis? Is time. It frequency or time? Time. And the y axis is uh, relative units of intensity. Time Can't be time. Say? Time is 1 over f. Yeah. Well, it's noise. But if you. Well, I'm not going to wait for that. Okay, so now you're sitting around and you're all excited. You think you found uh, an emission or transmission from Jupiter and uh, you sit there and you're excited and you go online and you check your email and you get email from people who've been doing this for years and they'll, they'll tell you, no, that wasn't uh, what was going on. And uh, these emails come and go. Right now we're in a prime Jupiter season, by the way. Okay, how do you really know if it's Jupiter? Well, you can listen to noise, and RFI could sound like Jupiter. And you, I mean, I've calibrated my radio using the blender in my house. I can turn on the blender, and I can calibrate the uh, vertical axis uh, with my blender. And then I discovered some other new stuff, like uh, I think the power company is using signals to turn the lights on and off. And uh, I picked that up, and it's interesting because it's moving later and later, just before the sun comes up. Right? So, I, however, you need a spectrograph to do this, and you can download a program that allows you to hook into live spectrographic data. It was developed by NASA, and it's free to anyone who wants to use it. And that's how you know if it's really from Jupiter, because what's whoops, what's interesting about the sounds from Jupiter? is that they're not stuck on one frequency. They're very broad band. Here we have time, but here we have frequency. 20.1 is what we use. The vertical, uh, the horizontal lines here represent radio stations of some kind. And this stuff is Jupiter. Here's the trace, and you see where the peak is, and the intensity changes and gets greater. You have peaks here, peaks here, peaks here, peaks here. This comes from a guy in Florida uh, that uh, that is well into this stuff. This guy sells tiles for a living, right? But you'd never know that he sold tiles for a living. I mean, this guy's got antennas, he's got knowledge, it's incredible. He's been doing it for a while. But that's a comparison, and you now know you have Jupiter. This is a display of both programs simultaneously that you can have running on your computer. Oh, you would say, ah, that's great. Look, Jupiter is right there. Problem is, Jupiter is, ooh, right in your beam. That's my antenna beam right there. So Jupiter is in the beam. 
It's right in a IOA, and it's probably very high, and my kirk is flat. <laughs> so that was a wasted night. <laughs> but this allows you to predict when you should be listening. Now, obviously, I let this thing run 24-7. You'll see why. Because our friend the sun is a radio source. Let's see what's going on with that. This thing you can't miss. Okay, here's a depiction of the sun in a very high frequency in x-ray. And a very bright area to represent high amounts of energy. And you start seeing a characteristic shape here. What does that remind you of? Magnetic lines of force. And of course, sunspots. And these are areas of magnetic magnetic and they're cooler areas on the sun because something is taking that hot material and moving it out. And the magnetic activity is going on. I used to tell my students they could do an experiment at home, at home, and I and I would always uh, disavow that I told them to do this because you know, the way things are today. So I said, take a toaster and don't put any bread in it and just put it down. And what happens when you push the little thing down? You look in the toaster. You still have toasters. You know what a toaster is, right? Hey, you look down in there, what do you see? Red hot. Red hot, red, right? Now, very carefully, take a straw and aim the straw. Don't touch the tip of the straw to the red stuff, all right? Keep it a little bit above it and blow gently. And see what happens where you are blowing gently across that red stuff. And that's all I'll tell you. If you'd like, you can do it at home, but I didn't tell you to do that if you bring it out. Sunspots, north and south, magnetic poles, and his characteristic feature that you see, is a have a name called prominences. All right, now the sun, again, what do you need? You need to accelerate something, you need to have magnetic lines of force of magnetic field, and you need charged particles. And by the way, that's the Earth, just to give you an idea size-wise. That's the magnetic field of the sun. Remember, Jupiter is so nice, it's sort of like the Earth's depiction. And again, nothing is like these pictures. It's always worse. It's like when you learned about the Earth and all different layers, and it's all nice and smooth, concentric circles, right? That's not how it works. But we have to make it that way so people will say, oh, look, I know all about the Earth. I know all about it. OK, this is OK. We've got these magnetic, really whacked up magnetic lines of force, not in any particular order. The sun is rotating. The thing's about a million miles across, okay? You got this big thing, a million miles across, rotating in 28 days. What happens in magnetic lines of force? They start to get twisted and convoluted. And then ultimately, again, this is an analogy, all right? Does it happen like this? Yeah, I saw it, but it's much more complicated. But you can imagine taking a rubber band and twisting around and around and around until it does what? Boom, breaks. Well, when it snaps, there goes a whole bunch of interesting particles that can be released and noise in the form of uh, transmission. So here we have what's going on in uh, this little movie. It's not an animation, that's an actual image. And you can see the prominence is very active. You can stick the earth under that area. Now, when the sun sometimes really lets out a big one here. You got a, cor a coronal mass ejection. And watch what happens when this interacts with the Earth. It's the Earth with its nice little magnetic field, and everything's hunky dory, and then all of a sudden, boom. Well, is that change going on? Sure, you've got emissions. So, what's happening here? Aurora. So, you got a nice increase in aurora. And the, the Earth is protecting us now. That's our little force field. It takes those particles, sends them around, completes the electric circuit. Uh, back through here, and uh, you have our magnetosphere protecting the Earth from all this stuff. See, most people think that there's nothing between us and the sun. Well, that's not quite right. It's very chaotic. This is a solar burst. Right? This is on the 26th of September. Here's what this sounds like. This was a big one. Where's that little guy? Here it is. the galaxy, and the galaxy, the noise from the galaxy, 
galaxy just got amplitude modulated. So we start with that flaw, that noise, and we just let, let it happen. Okay, remember the solar eclipse that happened a couple of weeks ago? discover that. That's the burst from that sunspot. Very huge, but it also did a couple of other interesting things. Whoops. Yes. Yes. What was that frequency of that peak? 20.1. Oh, the free, the, I'm listening at 20.1, so whatever I'm listening to is coming. And again, it's broadband, so it's happening. That's how you can also tell if you're listening to the Sun or Jupiter. You can off tune, and you'll still pick it up, depending on what's going on, where in the atmosphere of, of, of the Sun or altitude. Yeah. This is uh, the galactic transit. I, I did this. Um, again, it's the transit of the galaxy. This is a 24 hour uh, trace. And here you can see again the floor. That's what everything is built on. All the noise that's from the electronics in your radio and so, which is very, very minimal at these frequencies. And here you have uh, uh, the transit, in other words, the, the galactic, not the galactic center, because that's way down south, but the Milky Way galaxy came over, over my antenna. And you can actually see that. All right, now, what receiver to use? If you want to do this, what receiver do you use? Any high frequency transceiver, the receiver pilot, can be used as long as this meets uh, this uh, criteria. AGC must be able to be disabled. Why do you think that's the case? Well, yeah, well, what's AGC do? It makes the high stuff here, it makes the low stuff here, and what do we want to do? We want to hear the noise. We want to, if it goes high, we want it high. If it goes low, we want it low. So you got to turn it off. Most radios have slow and fast, but they don't have off. Some have off. I, I've been using a Yesu 450 that has off. Some say they have off, but it really isn't off. So you don't know until you use your calibration blender and turn it on and watch what the signal looks like. Because if the signal doesn't do this when it's on and it sort of does that, then you can't use it. You can use AM or single side bands. Um, I have bandwidth in a range of 2 nanometers to 10 kilohertz, blah, blah, blah. Probably the transceiver you already own. A really good, yeah. Uh, you don't need the S meter for any of that, right? Because I was just thinking, I've got one radio where the S meter shuts off if I turn off the AGC. You, know, you don't need the S meter. Right? No. So you probably have some that use it. An ICOM R75. Is one that a lot of uh, these people are using. Very nice receiver, very expensive, but uh, you can turn the AGC off. Now, commercial. <laughs> NASA is uh, responsible for underwriting Radio Joe. That's the name of the project. Now, of course, uh, as radio amateurs, we're always looking for something to do that's helpful and, and uh, does for society and so on. You know, some of you are going to do the field tour tomorrow and so on. But there are other things you can do. Like there's a whole educational aspect of this. And Radio Joe is the uh, 
the uh, project that uh, is involved. And if you'd like, I'll uh, get that website to you. Everything is there. And uh, the goal is to educate people about planetary and solar radio astronomy. Of course, you happen to be a hand. You've got one up on it. And uh, you can also take care of that. But a number of these people who started this program actually built, if you would like, you could buy a radio job receiver. And what's neat here is that, now again, if you have a couple of bucks to spare and you want to get involved with the school, you might purchase one of these kits. Everything here is less than $300. And, uh, I don't know, it's a lot of money, but hey, you can get a D-star transceiver. How about a pebble, you know? <laughs> Okay, the kit comes with enough wire to make the uh, dual array dipole. The radio receiver receives a 20.1, and it's built just to listen to noise. And uh, what's interesting about the system, you can hook it up to your laptop through a sound card, a $3 sound card in your hand, and uh, you get the free programs, and you can have a... Uh, it's a kit, or you can buy it, you buy it assembled. What they do is they like the kits to put the kit together. And they sort of get more out of it because now they put it together and they can listen to Jupiter. And of course, that's very thrilling. Except Jupiter doesn't come out all the time, right? And you can tell if it's working and very simply. You can tell if your radio is receiving too. Disconnect the antenna. What happens? All that galactic noise and radio noise goes away. And as soon as you plug it in, it comes back. With the script chart recorder, you can see that. Okay. And that's the end of my story. I'm skipping to a question. What kind of sensitivity does a receiver have to have? The antenna is the most important thing in this whole thing. Whatever, whatever is typical and whatever receiver you have, as long as it's capable, the, the limiting factor, if you can pick up the galactic background, you'll be able to listen to Jupiter. The sun plows through everything. You know, forget about the rules of the ionosphere doing this or that. The sun, when it does this, it comes through. All right? If you can pick up the galactic background, you'll be able to listen to Jupiter. If you can't hear the galactic background due to RFI or some other source, in other words, the level is very high, you're not going to hear it. Because remember what the floor was. It was the galactic background upon which the signal is, uh, is imposed. And how did you have to pick 20.1? That's the first stuff that people were doing. Plus, there's a, a physical explanation as well. Um, the intensity of the decameter emissions is strongest there because it goes up the scale. And it depends on where it's happening. These are also uh, circularly polarized. You get left and right polarization that you can pick up and you can uh, have your train your antenna to, to listen to those. So a lot of the synchrotron radiation and cyclotronic radiation that you can predict from theory suggests that you can what happens with frequency. And 20.1 is ideal. Now of course, what's at 20? WWV. So you can also check your equipment there, right? So, so when everyone is not listening or on their radios because it's noisy or the, you know everything's quiet, that's when you want to hear Jupiter. So there you go. So you, you can 24/7. Your wife will be happy. You can listen to Jupiter. You can DX. You can do anything you want. Thank you.